Well, shall we get started then? We, we shall. We should. People are waiting. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, where do we start? Cindy, do you want to introduce everybody? It's your meeting. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it is my meeting. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to do some exciting stuff today. But first, uh, we'll, we'll just go around and introduce all of our uh, four demonstrators of the day. Um, and I will start. I'm Cindy Drozda from Erie, Colorado. And I'm here in my shop, which you can see behind me there. Um, and so next, let's go um, clockwise here. And Steve, you're up next. I'm Steve Worcester. I'm from Plano, Texas, and I am with turningwood.com. And clockwise means that Todd's first, next, right? Okay, good. I don't know. It's anti-clockwise to me. Yeah, so. me too. <laughs> uh, I'm Todd Rains. I'm uh, coming to you from Allen, Texas, about three miles north of Steve. Um, and uh, in my shop, uh, struggling with a few technical things uh, today and, and last night as well. We're working through some, some new technology that uh, I think has promise um, to make things um, a little bit more interesting for what we do. So, um, yeah, tonight I'm looking forward to it. We're going to do a little collaboration and uh, come back tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to auction off those two. We have two collaborative uh, that we're going to do. Uh, that will be auctioned off. The auction proceeds will go to charities, and we'll we'll let maybe Joe and um, uh, Cindy talk a bit more about those charities. So, um, yeah, stick with us. We'll have a lot of fun. Oh, and tomorrow night, bring the popcorn because there's going to be some, a lot of fun and some raffles and some stuff to give away. So, mm -hmm. along with the auction, Joe, up to you. You're above me. Okay. So. <laughs> um. I'm Joe Fleming. I'm from San Diego, California, and I'm from Airbrushing Wood and uh, um, all things Grex products primarily. And uh, uh, we're excited to do what we got planned for you today. Um, and uh, Todd mentioned that we have two collaborations. We're going to show you one, and one's going to be somewhat of a surprise because we're not going to do it online. Uh, it'll be uh, offline that it gets completed so you won't see the finished product. Uh, if you happen to auction or bid on it in an auction, you have to trust that you're going to get a quality thing. Okay, and so are we going to start the collaboration right now? <laughs> um, Yes. Yeah, why not? Yes. Okay. Well, without further ado, then, um, Todd gets to go first because uh, he's going to make the first part of it. We're going to do a little collaborative, and I get the first part. So we're making a, a, a domed plate, if you will. And uh, so my first part is making the plate. So I've got a bit of a uh, multimedia sort of demonstration, if you will. I'm going to show a little bit of video that I pre-recorded. I do some live turning, and then we'll do the same thing for the other side of the plate. So uh, it just uh, allows me to get the whole project in. We're going to take about 20, 25 minutes each. Um, and so that'll fill out most of the hour, uh, two hours, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so, uh, and if you do have questions, I guess, if you could post them in the chat, and my fellow collaborators will... Uh, we'll be watching the chat, and, and uh, I've got a, uh, a note to speak up. Can everybody hear me okay, Cindy? Is, you, am I, is my volume okay? I can hear you. Um, you sound fine okay. to me, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so it's just uh, Mark needs to turn his speakers up. <laughs> so, good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's first of all just take a look at what I got here. Um, I've got a little uh, disc on the lathe. What I've started with is a nice piece of figured maple um, as a square. This is about six and a half inches wide. And uh, I stuck it between centers and I cut a, uh, a recess on one side, turned it around so I could turn the back, which is another recess and what you see on, on the, uh, on the uh, back of the plate here. So I'm going to show a little video of how that uh, first that part happened. So 
And there should be a little bit of background noise, uh, music. I put a little music to it, but I, I intend to talk over it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, it's very faint in the background, but. So here the, the piece is between centers, and here's a little tool I use. Um, and we'll, we'll see a picture of it here in a second. Uh, again, and I'll talk a little bit about it. It's, uh, it's uh, just a straight scraper that I've uh, ground to this profile. Uh, found this idea off of a, another YouTube uh, guy. And uh, if I clean off the shavings, I don't know. There's a, it's just a simple sort of um, scraper. You just grind it to a dovetail profile. And it's able to get uh, a recess cut while the tailstock is in the way. So I flipped it around on that recess in the chuck. I'm using an Axminster uh, SK100 with an O'Donnell Jaws, uh, two inch, just over two and a quarter inch maybe. Um, there it is. Pause. Oh, I just missed it. Uh, we'll see it again here in a second. I have to raise the rest a little bit for the scraping. And uh, so there you see the, the black marker uh, kind of indicates how I, I got to the shape I got to. So all that stuff you have to grind away to make this kind of tool. Uh, it's very handy um, and stuff, so uh, uh, especially when the tail stalks. But I use the same tool here, and uh, we we see I've got going up to the line and just creating another recess. So um, very simple and easy tool to to operate. And uh, there I'm just kind of getting to the final, cutting into the final sort of um, uh, mark, and I, I lost it a little bit, so I had to recolor it with a pencil just so I know where I'm going. I want the recess to be very close to the closed diameter of the jaws, so when I finish the plate, uh, there's no indications of that I had uh, jaws in there. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't mar up the surface. So, um, so yeah, I'm just putting a few um, nice features on the inner ring. Uh, that is, uh, you know, a, a sort of a finished bottom. It needs to be a little bit of sand in there. So here I'm kind of deciding whereabouts or how, where the, where the plate rim is going to really end. And uh, so it's really about, you know, about there. And so all of that top side, I am going to, all of that side, I'm pretty much going to waste away. So you could do this project with a blank that's probably 5 eighths thick. Uh, this one is close to an inch, seven eighths. So, so here I'm kind of indicating, and this is where I kind of want to use my new gadget. Um, so, let me set this up. Bear with me a second. I'm talking about how I'm shaping the rim, and uh, I just need to bring this up and do that. Do that. One more thing, and I'll be with you. Okay, so I have um, this rim here. And is that showing up? Oh, I haven't turned my key on. There we go. That, why is that orange there? I'm not quite sure why that's orange there. It's not showing up. Oh, you know what? Um, never mind. I had to reset my uh, ATEM and I didn't save those settings. So, what I'm what I'm um, uh, looking at is I've got a bit of a cove going on that. Uh, um, let me uh, going to back this out a little bit and get back to my regular screen. I'll have to save that technology for another day. Um, I've got a bit of a cove going on, but I want the rim to be cupped. And you'll see I'll come back the other way and we'll um, see how I'm going to go about cupping that. So and there's my hand, and I meant to draw on the screen and kind of show you what I was trying to get at. But you'll see it come about here in a second. Um, so I'm now going to kind of... So that faint line is really the end of the foot. So we're going to have about a half inch thick foot pad. And then the rest is going to be kind of coved out. And now I'm making an OG shape. So I'm starting that cupped rim uh, with that at the end with the OG. And uh, I uh, start to make this cove shape that will eventually come up to that line. And uh, just using a, 
uh, one of my standard bowl gouges is a 55 degree swept back wing gouge. We're kind of up to that line. Now I come back this way and this is where I make the, take the OG out and cut in and make a cup in the back uh, or a, a bowed shape in the back of the plate. And what that does is also is gives me a landing pad for the fillet at the bottom of the cove, right about there. So now I start to get that sort of plate sort of shape on the underside of the rim. Now I'm cutting the vertical wall of the cove fillet and sizing that to about four inches. So overall, this thing is about six and a quarter inches wide, uh, six and a half, somewhere in there. I want about a four inch inside plate. So my foot is gonna be four inches in diameter. That's gonna leave about a um, inch and a quarter rim uh, um, uh, size. So here I'm showing how this uh, teardrop cutter now the shape of it is very similar to the cove, so it's a perfect tool uh, to use that. And I'll show that live here in a minute as well. So it's a great, uh, great tool for getting a scraping cut right down in that cove. And uh, not just a different angle on it. You can kind of see how the curve kind of fits in there nicely. And I'm able to kind of go up and clean any sort of rim issues. And I roll it right over and I cut the sidewall of this fillet with it too. So that bevel on there is about a 70 degree bevel, uh, 70, 75, I can't remember. And I cut down that sidewall and I'm able to get the corner of that cutter right in that corner and scrape away. So uh, this is uh, how I shear scrape uh, the plate. So there, that's the plate pretty much done. We've got a, a pretty good finish where we can start sanding and probably uh, 240 or 400 or something like that. So. That is, that is that finished. And so now we're live here in front of me and I will do a bit of that uh, scraping with the teardrop cutter uh, just to give you a flavor for it and uh, talk a little bit more about the tool. So a little tool rest in here. Now this is a, uh, uh, a teardrop, I'll take it out of the hole of the bar for a second to just kind of see the size of it. It's T1 high speed steel. There's two sizes of it. There's uh, this is the smaller size, about an inch and a half long, three quarter wide, an eighth of an inch thick. And it's got a slot in it, so it makes it very easy to mount on your bar. And this bar is a three quarter inch bar stock that's milled half round. And I'm gonna point the fat end of this cutter just slightly off to the left. Uh, that's where I preferred for this cut and right now it's unhandled i'm doing such a small piece i don't really need a handle i can grip it fairly well in my hand and uh, and i'll do a little bit of this cove cutting in here and i'll zoom in a little bit and uh, let's see if we can put up that in the picture in picture and uh, grab my Safety goggles. I'm going to double check the uh, the chuck. I did this earlier today, so I just want to double check. That feels good. Nice and solid on there. Speed all the way down. Power on. Speed back up. It's running nice and true again, which is nice. Um. So I've got the tool rest down where I'm kind of close to center with the handle quite low. Um, and so I'm going to see where I'm going to cut right into there. Now let's see. Uh, it's pretty good. I'll, I'll leave it there. Maybe I'll bear with me a second as I tilt this out just a little bit. Be a bit better view. So it just fits right in there. I could use a bit more speed, probably 2200. Nice keen edge on this tool. I just sharpened it just a, a little bit ago. Now I'm just going to move this back just a little bit so I can get my tool rolled over. I'm rolling it right over and, and this bevel on this cutter is kind of kind of bump into that, that turning right there. So I'm just going to open it up just a little bit. 
then grab a little slice and I'm kind of skating a little bit. Huh. And now I'm able to cut right in there and I don't know if you can see that shiny mark right off that rim there, right where that shine is. That shows you just it's, it's just a very well burnished cut surface on this rim on this fillet. So now the rest of the, uh, the scraping just kind of happens uh, regular negative rake scraping. And it's really sheer scraping is kind of a form of negative rake. So I'm going to tilt this a bit more so my tool rest is a bit more conformed to the shape I'm scraping. So I've got it, uh, the half round part of the bar is really what's able to allow me to do this any sort of angle that I need. I need to get into this angle, I need to get over to this angle. And so it allows me to kind of move this tool wherever I need it. And then the variability on the radius of my cutter allows me to get into many shapes. So um, that scrapes up, scrapes up really quite well. Um, so that's uh, essentially how that tool works. Um, and so when I sand, I'll sand this surface, I'll sand this surface, but I won't really touch this one or that fillet in there. I'll leave that alone because I think that's a good enough surface. This this cove I may sand a little bit with 400 or something, but um, now we've got to just, uh, you know, put some decorations in there. And uh, the other thing I did before I turn it around is I'll take my gouge and I'll just cut, you know, a, a nice clean cut on the rim here. Um, and all this material between my finger and my thumb is really going to go away. So that's the uh, that's the uh, the backside pretty much done. Um, before I take it off, um, I will just put my little rings in there. Little three point tool. So got one facet facing up. Kind of roll it either side to side to get a little cut. I'll put a little ring right close to that. And then one right here where I've got a little a little mark there. So this uh, center point is pretty much done now. All I need to do is sand that a little bit, uh, take the fuzzies down, and this is good for a finish. Um, so let's, let's take that off and uh, we will start the video for the front side. So there you can see, uh, just, uh, I didn't turn my overhead on. You can see how much of a gap there is between the jaws when I tighten this up. There's not a whole lot there. So it's a pretty tight circle. Um, not that it matters on this side, it's gonna be cut away. But when I hold it on this side, which I will do on this piece, there's not much of a gap um, when I open that up. So this one has a bit more, but um, it's a perfect circumference and it's going to run true and it's not going to leave marks on the inside. So let me key up the, uh, the next clip. I think it's that one. Let me uh, go back, turn that off and play that one. So this is the front side. Um, this is basically using my 40-40 gouge now, and I'm going to just peel away a bunch of waste wood here um, on the uh, on the front side. So it's just a matter of wasting away wood down to where I think the rim thickness is going to be, and I've just jumped ahead through some of that. And what you can't really quite see in that picture is the back side where the cove sits. So uh, what I'm trying to do is line up this this rim uh, or this uh, um, this width of rim with the width of the rim in the back. And that's kind of what I'm trying to show here. So my fingers there are kind of judging where that back rim is. If I pause that for a second and I just switch over here, you can see what I'm talking about here is here's the cove and here's the rim that I'm going to leave on the front side and they're at the same depth. So I've got the same distance on both sides. So we'll move the tool rest a little bit and then uh, we'll remove, uh, we'll come back with the, the gouge and start scooping this time. Instead of making a, uh, oh, I'll get these words. This is a concave cut. 
backside is convex. So we're trying to make an even wall thickness through this uh, through this rim. About an eighth of an inch thick uh, is what I've got on this one. So, And uh, my heel on this gouge is relieved a little bit, so I do have a bit of uh, forgiveness and I don't get as much heel or bruising in the wood from the heel of the tool. I've been using my 4040 quite a bit more um, than uh, uh, lately, so, and that was just wasting a bunch of wood away so I can get the tool rust a little bit closer, still leaving the core or the center there, um, so I have uh, uh, some good um, stable material to work with. And here I'm just kind of slicing with the bowl gouge that wall. I'm going to leave a little, uh, I guess, tenon, if you will, around the circumference of the bowl part of the, the plate if you will. And that uh, is going to be a reference place for the dome. Uh, so the dome has a place to, uh, to register against. So now we're using the teardrop scraper now on the inside of the, uh, the rim. And since the rim is uh, uh, kind of thin now, I back it up with my fingers to try and stop some vibration and take some very light cuts. Um, you can see the, the light shavings coming off. And so Trying to do that all the way through the, the whole stretch. I'll bump the, uh, the cutter up to that rim, which I'm going to do the same sort of technique and cut that, that side wall of that fillet, if you will. So, um, I don't know about the angle on the three point tool. I think it's 40 degrees. I think I just used my 40 degree angle uh, that I have set up on my rest. Um, I can't quite remember. So, here's that cut again. Going down that side wall, you can see the I had to just change the angle so I can get a bit more of a cut. And one more pass. It's a little bit fuzzy because I zoomed in on this a little bit. So you kind of get to see there, you get a nice pass and it starts to get a nice cut on that wall. Okay, you said that tool was T1. Is that 10 tongue? Uh, yeah, T1, uh, tungsten. It's 17% tungsten. Oh, okay. Um, T1 steel is uh, steel they used uh, on industrial planer blades. And in fact, that's how I make these um, industrial planer blades, uh, water jetted out, and I grind them here in the shop. I'm going to have to get a phone number for your water jet guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, just wasting the center away, just high speed, you know, speed through that part. And now coming back with the 4040 gouge, trying to cut the interior. Um, and. Uh, it doesn't get me the right sort of uh, radius curve inside there. It's a little bit too big. I could probably grab a smaller gouge and maybe have better luck, but uh, you'll see shortly that I uh, I just kind of leave it rough and fix that with my teardrop scraper. So, and here we're just kind of wasting away this center part and rust through that. Now I'm down to a flat uh, bottom on there. Uh, the thickness between the recess in the foot and the top of the plate is probably about three sixteenths at this point. I've got a little tear out in the center so I start scraping and uh, get rid of that uh, down to that level all the way across. So I guess I could, uh, this is a little bit weird with me in both places. So, um, so this is their teardrop cutter getting in that cove uh, or that rounded part of the, the rim. You can see that raised rim is really what's going to, the dome is going to uh, fit over so and that's uh, that's Cindy's part coming up next but uh, I'll show you a bit of this live um, some of this turning and, and this project this part of the project and uh, then uh, then we'll turn it over to Cindy hopefully this uh, this one works well this is a I've got this is number five plate I've made for this collaborative I think <laughs> four or five so uh, you know there's lots of good practice but it makes uh, makes practice you know doing these repetitive plates like this is is you, you, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how consistent I've been with, uh, with how they've come out so and after a little bit of sanding uh, we've got a nice nice finish this piece had a little uh, little um, branch grain in the side there you see and a, a little mineral spirit just kind of pop the grain just to see what it's going to look like uh this is a little eye candy at the Ooh. end so uh, i thought this was a uh, and this board i got is a beautiful piece of figured maple so i was really quite happy to uh to turn this stuff i've got five four blanks left after these two plates i've got going so beautiful beautiful wood 
So very nice. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the end of the video. So let me oops zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna just reposition this, and we will put that up. And I'll push this back a little bit this way, and we'll uh, we'll take out the interior of this one. So. Um, we'll do a little bit of bowl gouge work here. Uh, how am I doing on time, Cindy? I think I'm good, um, right? I don't know. I'd say you're good. Okay. I wasn't keeping track, though, but we're yeah. good. It's it's interesting. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so just a little bit of gouge work. Uh, we'll get rid of most of this. And this has uh, been placed back on a layer that's running very nice and true, and that... Uh, um, uh, that um, what do you call this thing? Chuck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, get my get my mug back on there a little bit. So, uh, so just some cut straight into the wood, wasting away some wood. Oops. Put the tool on the tool rest first. Always helps. It's kind of nice this project working this way, uh, getting most of the heavy cuts by pushing in, uh, so it's not really a, too stressful on the uh, on the uh, mortise back there. Um, so it's not until I get most of that waste wood out here that I kind of come back and do a cross grain bowl cut, and I'm just going to adjust the rest. A little bit, then we'll get on this lip here, and then we'll kind of figure out how how thick we want that rim. I'm going to leave it a little fat using the uh, using the uh, teardrop scraper. We'll take some of that away. I don't want to push too hard at the center there. That's how I got that tear out, that last one in the video. The wood is not spinning quite so quickly in the middle. At least the surface speed is a lot slower, so you have to go a little slower. And let me just check to see where we got lots of thickness here. It still can go a little deeper. I kind of slide my gouge back and forth to kind of see where the bumps are and hmm. that looks pretty flat in that center part but I've got some bumps out here. So this is the time where I'd kind of start to use the uh, teardrop. So I drop the rest just a little bit. It's kind of counterintuitive for a scraper but I'm going to drop the handle quite a bit on the on the scraper and use this upper part and just kind of do a lot of shear scraping up here. And this is where I turn the tool into really kind of a cutting tool right in this corner and get that uh, that corner done. So it's bouncing a little bit here, so I'll just kind of go a little slower. A little back and forth, just kind of consistent sort of weight on the pressure on the wood to kind of get all the high spots out. Famous saying by Don Derry. At least what I learned when I took lessons with him. Just remove the high spots. That's all you need to do. Nothing else to wood turning except for removing the high spots. Hmm. We'll take a look at the quality of cut for a second. And I've got, of course, in the end grain, I got some tear out here. Let me swap those around. Put that there and put that one there. And you can kind of see if I oh, yeah. maybe put that over. So there's some tear out right in here. 
And of course, on the opposite side, there's a little bit. So we'll try and concentrate on those. One thing I uh, I did in the uh, in the practice session, and I I, uh, I may just show it here. This may be uh, weird for some people. Hmm. It certainly is for me. I'm going to do this though. I've got on my chuck here. I should have put my overhead on. I've got set screws in here. So those are tightened down. I'll double check them. And that's locking my chuck onto the uh, spindle. I'm going to turn in reverse here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn in reverse and I'm going to scrape this down this way. So the, the wood's going to go up this way. I'm just going to scrape down. And what it's going to do is hopefully lay down that um, tear out that's kind of torn out from this direction to lay down in the other direction. So flip the switch, opposite direction. We're going backwards. I put the tool rest this way so I get my hand down low. It's a blind cut because you can't see the interface between the the cutter and the uh, and the wood, but it, it's an interesting technique that worked well for me on on the other piece. So it cut down a lot of that uh, that raised grain there. So uh, it's just something to uh, to be uh, if you're going to try this kind of technique, make sure you lock your chuck down, uh, make sure that you're comfortable in what you're doing. And uh, so this is definitely interesting. The other thing I could do is I could shear scrape on that side over there, but um, I'm here, I'm just gonna do some some cutting here. It really is a blind cut, so you really kinda gotta be very gentle with the way you're moving. Interesting techniques, I think I'll turn it around and finish up with the uh, traditional way. And get in there. Other way now. And come back and and the one other thing I would do at this point is go and resharpen this guy and take one final pass and clean that up. It's not bad though. It took a lot of that uh, torn grain out. There's just a little bit right there. And uh, yeah, it's not bad all the way around. So a little bit right in there. So that, um, I think, is going to be close to my time. So you guys let me know. So let me do one thing here. My wife is saying there's some questions. So we'll get those questions in a second. But I will take this plate. And uh, let me turn that off. And let me turn uh, my, that's full, full size. So we'll do this and we'll hand that off to Cindy. So, so that's the, uh, that's the plate. Um, take a closer look at it. It's got a nice thin rim, nice thin profile. It's got a, a, a rim here to catch the dome. The foot is uh, the same diameter as the plate top. And we've got a concave here and a con concave here and a convex there. So yeah, that's uh, very nice. Very nice. That's the plate. So do you want to get those questions now for this uh, part of the demo? Um, that would actually make sense. I think you got the questions that were in the chat. Um, uh, the cutter is high speed steel. Yes. yes. Um, what grind speed? angle do you all like to use on your, okay, 40 degrees, I think is what I said on the point tool. I'm really not sure. I'll measure that. Um, yeah, I think. Oh, lathe speed? Yeah, I think I was turning at twenty one hundred. So whatever you're comfortable with, I've gone between sixteen and twenty two hundred on this project. And you just got another question here. How do you sharpen the mm. the scraper and the cutter? Yeah, so let me uh Bear with me a second. There's a little, uh, I can do a little thing here. Um, cast. Let me change that one. 
let me go small actually let me go right off i'm already up in the corner if we go to the web page here i have to apply my mouse that's not the one that's the one um so on my web page under explore wood turning there's wood turning tips and techniques videos there's a little video how to sharpen the t1 high speed steel teardrop cutter and that'll kind of start playing in this up here but if i jump ahead it's really just uh, straight on the platform and that platform is set at about 75 degrees and just mm -hmm. uh wind it around i'm using a 180 degree wheel there um you can uh use any sort of CBN you, you have or want. I just use my fingers um, for you know, touching it up and stuff. Um, and when I'm grinding, I'm on the other wheel of this grinder, an 80 grit wheel, which, uh, which I, where I put the, uh, the, the grind on it. This is just resharpening, so. And just a matter of just kind of touching it and that's it. So yeah. Uh, lots of little, uh, well, few tips and trick videos, lots of project videos on, on this, uh, my website as well. Good questions. And okay, so are we ready to move on now? Yeah, I believe so. So uh, did I pass you the plate? Here it is. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so thanks, Todd. I'm ready to do yep. my part of it. Um, I, don't, I think we've, we can get more questions at the end of all four of our demos. So save your questions up. If you have a question for Todd you didn't get, um, and I'll try to get any questions that you have uh, for me, um, but we'll have more time at the end. So if you wanna wait, wait for that. Sounds good, I'll, I'll take the spotlight off. Okay. Oh, you got it. And good here stuff. I am. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you, Todd. I got my uh, plate here and I'm going to make a lid for it is uh, what's going to be my part of this. Um, I have a pre recorded video because I can't really get this done in my 20 minute time slot. Uh, so I'm going to be um, narrating the video and uh, that way I can explain things and I can pause and uh, answer questions if we need to. So here we are. I'm starting with a piece of curly maple and this is this is curly maple of a different species but you'll see it it, it might come out uh pretty good and then joe's going to paint it anyway so um so let's get started here with what i'm doing i'm using this disc uh to to draw around it and cut that out on the bandsaw and then i use the center of the disc to find a hole for my tailstock. I'm just using friction drive here between the tailstock and the chuck jaws to drive the piece so that I can cut a chuck tenon and uh, face protection on. Let's get rid of that there. Oh, get rid of that one. Okay. Uh, I'm presenting the cutting edge to the side grain here. This is the wing of my bowl gouge, 40-40 grind, half inch diameter bowl gouge and I don't need much really of a tenon for length uh, to to save the uh, thickness of the piece skew as a scraper there to create a little dovetail tenon and now I'll put this in the chuck jaws uh, you'll notice that I didn't open my jaws any more than the uh, little round over past the body of the chuck uh, this is an Axminster Chuck here with their standard jaws. So same cut again, I'm just truing up um, what will be the inside of the lid to fit with this platter. Lock the calipers, and then I'll scribe that diameter onto the spinning piece by making a scribe mark with the point of the caliper closest to me, and then another one until I get a scribe mark that will line up with the far point of the caliper, though I will never touch the far point to the work. And once again, pre presenting the cutting edge to the side grain. Oh, and uh, lathe speed is probably all the way up for this project, 3,500 RPM. There's another view of it. 
Uh, and now again, pre presenting the cutting edge to the side grain. I'm cutting, this is a side grain project, we're gonna call it, uh, because the grain of the wood is perpendicular to the bed of the lathe. I'll set my uh, depth gauge here to what I think I want. So instead of um, checking what I have, I'm going to turn until I have the depth I want, almost there. And we'll just get a little bit, a little bit uh, deeper there. And then I'll have a depth that should work for me. Uh, I'm going to remove a lot of the bulk here with this cut with the wing until I get out close to the rim. And I'm going to use my recess cutter to give me the, the fit of the rim. Center out of there, just to make the recess cutter's job a little bit easier. A close up of how the bowl gouge is cutting directly in on the end grain. There's a recess cutter. It's got a cutting edge on the side parallel to the other side of the tool. So I hold it parallel to the bed of the lathe and I get a parallel sided recess. Now the rim on the platter or the, the, the lip that I'm trying to fit over is not a parallel surface, but I want to have a parallel surface so I can jam check it. And I'll get a little negative rake scraper there on the, on the rim, uh, on the face to clean that up. And deeper in the corner. Now I'm going to get most of the inside hollowed out. You'll notice I did not do the outside thin at the rim first, and that's to keep plenty of support for the cuts I'm doing when I get out close to the rim. I've got my depth there that I don't want to go any deeper than just yet. And this is a push cut with a 40-40 grind bowl gouge, swinging the handle to create the curve. I'll get my little gouge, this is a 3 8 diameter, same 40-40 grind, to get in that smaller diameter cove at the, uh, right at the corner. Now if I had made this, this recess for the, to fit over the, the lip on the platter, if I had left the step there, some of this inside hollowing would be a little easier. Uh, but I wanted a clean look. So here's a negative rake scraper I'm going to now use to clean up the shape that I've made, just to get the, the gouge ripples out and smooth the surface. I'm not really removing bulk with the negative rake scraper. Here's a round nose one, uh, 50 degree included angle on these scrapers. And I'm holding them level on the tool rest to do the cut, trying to work in toward that parallel recess that is already to size. So I'm trying to blend right up to it with these radius scrapers. And then I'll, I'll blend that small radius one with the larger radius. And yeah, my thumb's in the way there, sorry. But you can see the nice shavings I'm getting with these uh, negative rake scrapers. It gets a pretty clean cut. And now I want to sand the entire inside. And I get my sandpaper from uh, turningwood.com. That's also one of those Skilton uh, pads he talked about. I like to protect my lungs. Um, I like that 3M thing, but for better protection, I'll wear the, uh, the Trend Air Shield, which is a powered uh, fresh air feed respirator. And I'm doing the most of it with the pad. And then I'll get right up next to the rim in that small radius with handheld sandpaper, just with my fingers. Uh, when the sandpaper gets dull, I keep a pair of scissors here. Don't use your wife's quilting scissors for this. It's just bad form uh, to get a fresh, fresh edge on the sandpaper. And I'm sanding this, this uh, rim here, too, in the, in the corner. Uh, to polish, I use Avrilon. This is the greatest stuff. It, it, it really gets a nice finish on the wood. And I find that bare wood polished to 4,000 grit looks great no matter what kind of finish I put on it. And I know there's some debate about that. It might be Joe who's going to debate that. 
So we'll have some fun with that. Uh, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 with the Avrilon. And I'm going to call the inside of the lid done and start working on the outside. Avrilon actually lasts a really long time. You might find some cheaper substitutes, but they don't seem to last as long. Now I'm going to thin down that rim. And you notice how the gouge is kind of jumping to our left? And that is because I am making my entry cut with the flute closed a little too much. And then I'm opening it just enough to get the good cut. The reason I do that is so that the gouge won't skate the other way, which would be a big disaster for my, uh, my lid rim. Use a negative rake scraper just to round over that corner a little bit. And I tried to get the rim of the lid about the same thickness as the rim of the, uh, the lip it's going to fit over. Uh, what is my usual sanding speed? Well, I don't have a tachometer on my lathe, so my usual sanding speed, here we're going to uh, transfer the diameter again. My usual sanding speed, lathe speed, is um, slow enough that it doesn't get hot on my fingers. And um, 500 RPM, two, three, seven, eight, I don't know. Uh, again, scribing with the near point of the caliper. And I'm holding the far point close to the work so that I can see that it would fit in the groove. Now I'm using this tool as a, a peeling cutter. And then I raise the handle, negative rake scraper, and scrape a taper on that uh, fitting surface. Doesn't quite fit. OK, so then I will now make it a parallel tenon up to where the taper ended. Let's see how that fits. Uh, I close the flute on entry so that the gouge won't skate. And then I open the flute uh, sometimes to make the cut a little easier. But that was not what I said. I'll have to explain that one later because we're going to move on here. So that's a good uh, jam fit for this here, um, I'm going to say. And I want to give a little relief here. This is so that my fingers can get in there to take the piece off at the end and also for sanding. Deeper those sharp corners, you can cut yourself. Right there, I made that lip that it fits up against, the shoulder it fits up against, narrow. And that's so that I have access to the entire outside shape, including that little corner that I might want to deburr uh, and round over a little bit. So here's that same um, cut presenting cutting edge to the side grain. And if I have the flute of the gouge perfectly closed, that is the gouge in the uh, nine o'clock position, flute in the nine o'clock position, the gouge will not skate to either direction. If the flute's open too much, it'll skate inward toward the flute. If it's closed too much, it'll skate away from the flute. What I'm doing here now is a push cut. And you'll see to get some curve to my shape, I have the hand on the end of the handle swinging the tool around to give me that curvature. And I'm trying to make this cut blend right up to where I already thinned out the rim to what I want. So the, the hand on the end of the handle is swinging to make the curvature. I can't really reach anymore until I get the tail stuck out of the way, so I'm just removing a bit of bulk here. With the wing of the gouge presented to the side grain. And uh, the cut that I'd really like to do, since that one's not going to work, is this cut, because this is easy access with the tail stock up. This is technically the wrong cut, because I'm cutting, uh, I'm lifting the fibers. I'm cutting across the fibers in the wrong direction uphill and you can see there's a tiny bit of tear up but actually really not bad i could have just done that cut on this particular piece of wood what i'm going to show you is the uh quote unquote proper cut we'll tape it on so i can take the tailstock away and i use good quality tape so that it's nice and sticky and with the tape on and a pretty good jam fit i'm confident to take away the tailstock and shape the curve on the outside of the lid. 
Just use the wing to smooth out that very center where the knob's going to go. And then here's the cut. It's awkward looking, but it's actually not too bad because here I am cutting downhill across the supported fiber. And I've got my end of the tool hand out on the end of the handle swinging toward me to create the curvature. The hand close to the tool rest is not touching the tool rest so that the tool can swing around and travel across the tool rest as it needs to to create this cut. Acquiring the cut is a soft entry and then swinging the handle around to create that curve as I push with my end of the tool hand to make the tool progress through the work. My hand close to the tool rest is not pushing the tool into the wood or trying to move it sideways. That hand is just acting as a weight. And we find this last little bit of the radius there, blending it right up to that bit that I already did, defining the thickness of the rim. And we got a bump there, so I think I'm going to need to take that bump out. Set the tool rest a little bit for better support. And I'm acquiring the cut by contacting the heel, and then I'll bring the handle toward me until I get the cut just happening, push into the wood, and gradually make the cut to blend across that bump and blend in with the uh, already finished bit right next to the rim of the lid. Now I'm done with that. I'm going to drill the hole. And Steve asked for a half inch hole for his knob that he's going to make. This is an end mill cutter, a metalworking cutter in a Jacob's chuck in the tail stock. As soon as the end mill cutter, and I like this because it's flat on the end, gets right to there, I'm going to make a mark on the tail stock ram and advance the cutter into the into the lid, watching that that pencil mark, and that's just because I don't have a uh, scale on my tailstock ram on this lathe, so I'm using that line to tell me. Eighth inch deep, that's what he asked for, three millimeters by 13, and I'll find the center of this with, my, with the corner of my thin parting tool, and that's only because I want to put the tailstock up now, so I can take the tape off. This is a miniature live center with a 3 8 diameter a uh, 10 millimeter, very tiny cup point. I like to have the piece spinning as I fully advance the point because it seems to center up better. And now I've got tailstock support, so no worries at all. I'm using a negative rake scraper with a 50 degree included angle here. This is the skew shaped one. Uh, I don't actually use this as a skew. It's not a great shape for a skew, but look at those shavings, very nice. And I'm just, uh, doing a final cleanup and shaping on this surface. I look at a negative rake scraper, not as a substitute for a gouge or a skew, but as a substitute for coarse sandpaper. So what I'm going to be doing is starting my sanding with 240 grit instead of something coarser. And I, I feel like that gives me a more accurate surface. 240. I like to cut these three inch discs in half, four in thirds. And I'm just doing this one with the sandpaper held in my hand instead of using the, um, the drill motor. I'll start with 240, 400, 600, and then we'll go 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 with the Avalon pads and give a nice, nice polish to that piece. And here, it is, and I'm ready to take it off the jam chuck. And here's why I made this surface here so that I can get my fingers in there and pry it off. So let's see how it fits. Very nice. I don't want a terribly tight fit. I'd like it to be just a little bit loose because this is side grain. The grain is running, well, 
across the piece. So I'm likely to get some shrinkage in one direction more than the other, which means that if I made a real tight lid, it might not fit so well over time, especially if we end up sending this to uh, Florida or South Carolina or some humid place. I'm in a very dry climate. So very nice profile here. Nicely decorated bottom. And the piece is now uh, lidded and I'm ready to pass it on to Steve. So Steve, it's your turn. Hooray! So what I'm doing is making a, a handle or a knob. So as an example, this is one during my test turnings and this is a 3D printed and then resin cast. And this material is actually waste material. As I cut off from the other ones, what I do is I save those shavings and then cast them in another block. So it has this little pink area, but that's gonna get blown away. And what I'm doing is I'm using a really, really small point Uh, this is uh, a point Cindy makes, and it's actually made for a one way, and this is a robust, but it fits fine. I haven't had any issues with it. But what it allows you to do is, especially in an area where you may need to reposition this, which I'm not going to need to, but if I needed to reposition it, it's going to be considerably easier to do it um, because I just, I can move it just little bits without having a big giant point to have to, to move around. And what I'm gonna do first, and there's a lot of ways you can do this, and you'll see that a lot, is I'm going to use a badan. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just, I probably, I don't do justice to anybody from France using a badan, but it works for me. Um, and it's a real simple tool to use. So let's get on here. And you just bring the tool up. And then just bring it down into it. Different than my cohorts, this is all live. <laughs> I normally do this with a uh, vacuum running, but then that would be a lot of extra noise. And what I'm gonna, because I need to get down to a half inch to put it in my chuck, I need to do this fairly smoothly because otherwise that happens and which is okay, I have plenty of room. But what happens is you just get these major fractures running through it. Um, and those fractures actually will run deep underneath it. But in this case, I got plenty of room, so that's not gonna be a problem. But you could also use, say a gouge. You just want to make sure you don't force the cut.
or he could use a skew. A skew tends to load it up a little more. So you may have to stop and clean it up some. Okay, let's lower this a little. Okay, was there a question about Aberlon versus Abernet? Is that what that is? Can you guys hear me okay? I can't hear anything. We hear you. Okay. You're fine. So I know that I need to get this down to about a half inch because I'm gonna hold it in a collet chuck. because eventually what I want it to look like is this. I want it to just be a plug with a stub so that I can put it in the collet chuck. I'll show you the collet chuck when we get to that point. And right now I'm doing an illegal cut. I'm using the bedan upside down. It acts kind of like a shear scraper, even though there isn't a uh, isn't a burr on it. Okay, so right now we're at 0.578, so we need to bring 78 off of there. And so now what I do is I use a uh, shear scraper. This is a uh, Thompson half inch. I would like something thicker, but it's a little bit hard to get the material now. Um, uh oh, we may have just posted that. But there's, I got. You know, I didn't do that once in practice. All right, so we just need to keep peeling some material off there. Oh, the French use it upside down. I did not know that. I don't know how to speak French, otherwise I'd say it in French. So here's my own. Shear scraper. These, uh, before anybody really had them available, I bought the material from uh, CPM. 
and shaped them and then sent them to Doug and he was nice enough to throw them in his batch of stuff that was getting. Thank you. You're welcome. In his batch of things that were getting uh, done and uh, now I have those. Sorry, didn't realize it was off mute. That's all right. It makes for good uh, fodder. Okay. What we do is we just kind of tease this in. We're at 570 right now, right back where I was. And it's amazing when you're here by yourself and you're doing it, you know, everything's fine, no rush, everything works great. But knowing the amount of demonstrations I've done you always have a contingency plan. I was doing an AEW demonstration on hollowing and ripped the thing or at AEW and ripped the vessel right out of the chuck. Broke the tenon off. But I had another one. It's getting really close here. What we want to do is this is going into an exact half inch collet. And the collets have decent tolerance. So now that we got that done, what we want to do is come in clean this up a mite and we want to have a little bit of area because it's such a small lid what I want to do and the, the lid has a dome to it what I want to do is get some concave in here so when it sits on top of the lid the lid is going to hide the uh the stub come on you guys I want to get just enough concave in there so it will hide itself in the uh, in the lid. Yeah, we're okay. All right. So now what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to just part off the bottom here. Since we don't need it. And thankfully, nothing went to flying. All right. So we have this ugly stub. And then what we're going to do once we find the chuck key, which was here a minute ago, of course. Oh, there it is. So you could take all of this and cast it again.
All right, so what I have is a Beal collet chuck. And it uses E32 collets. And I have a off-brand one as well, but I like the Beal so much I bought it last week. Um, just so that it's uh, just a little bit cleaner. All right, and because I have that little recess and I wanna cut down into it, what I've done is printed these, it's a just a 3D printed piece of plastic. So that I have a little bit of area to make a cut in this way without hitting the chuck. Now we bring this back again. How much time do I got? As much as I want, evidently. If you don't get greedy, it's a lot easier to work with. So I use a Lumalite that I get from Turntex. Curtis has been a, uh, a great supporter of my work as well as many people's work. And you really, you're, the thing about resin is that there is no grain direction to it, but it can be kind of finicky depending upon the type of resin you have. In this case, this is a uh, polyurethane. And your choices really are kind of polyurethane and epoxies. I'm not a fan of epoxies, mainly because they tend to yellow really quick, although it's getting better. And they tend to have a really long open time, meaning it could take a day for it to set. But you can see it has this almost like spaghetti burl figure. If you've ever seen a good oak burl. Oh, I thought you said cut like a Steve. I'm like, what? Yeah, I am not as uh, practiced or gifted, if you will, in that regard. So when I normally do this, I have a, a dust collector. Uh, I have a four inch hose that I hang off of here that I've made a grate for it. 
so that if I lose the piece, it doesn't get sucked up in the in the hose and ruin my dust collector. Why does that keep happening? There we go. Okay, we're getting close, I swear. Now we need to get some of this down. It's almost easier to watch it in the on the monitor than it is from here. Okay, so you can see that I have this little area here now. So what I wanna do is make just a little bit of detail there that helps hide the, the uh, line. I figured it would be uh, more entertaining if I don't fight the skew. Okay, getting much closer. So this is a 3 8 detail gouge. And of course we want to see everything here. And here's my little undercut. And for that, this is uh, Cindy's little teeny tiny, I don't know what you call this gouge. It's some kind of detail gouge. I like that. And then what we can do is use the skew like a shear scraper, clean up a little bit of the ridges there. 
Okay, I like that. And then we got to figure out what to do with the top. We want to make sure, it, even though we have this little tiny point in the top, we want to make sure that we're not going to have that as a feature in the final piece. So we want to cut in enough of that to where when I pull the tailstock away, hopefully it's out of there. Okay, how much damage did I do by dragging the tool across there? Not bad. Okay. All right. So here's the basic shape of the, well, not the basic, it's pretty much the final shape. So we want to get the, the live center out of the way, make sure we don't poke ourselves on that. Any questions so far? Why do I not use negative rate carbide tools? Because negative rate carbide tools don't have a burr on them. All they are is it's, it just doesn't have a cutting edge. And the problem with a negative rate carbide scraper is that, um, Where's the paper? Is that carbide in that manner doesn't get as sharp as the other, as a tool steel like a M2, M4, CPM, etc. Okay. Now we pull the tail stock away. And the other magic comes in. Now we go to the finishing. So what I'm going to do is use Aberlon. But first, I want to make sure that it's cleaned up. So I take some Abronet. and see if I got all of my ridges out and is it going to affect anything? So that was a 400. I still see a little ridge in here. So I'm gonna back down to 320. A ah. little bit of a problem there. A little better. So I had where I had uh, momentarily lapsed and touched the gouge in the corner here on that feature, there was what I could see when I sanded a uh, little problem with, uh, with that feature. And so I had to go back and, and cut that a little bit. All right. So now we just do a little touching up here with 400. And we start the, uh, the Aberlon. So Aberlon is a foam back permeable 500, 1000, 2000, 3000, 4000. Uh, for a long time, we didn't even know 3000 existed. So we, skipped it and if you don't have a stainless steel bed don't do this
So I get them a little bit saturated. So oops. normally what I would do is um, quite often I'll just put a uh, towel down. Make sure you get into the recesses. It's actually, a, especially with a small piece, it's a fairly fast uh, program. But it's a really durable paper or a product, especially using it wet. It's pretty hard to uh, over sand. The reason you want to start off with a lower crit, though, is because you don't want to get up to the point where you got a 4,000 on there. And then you had a scratch that 400 didn't remove. And it becomes painfully obvious when you get to the 4,000 part. It's hard to tell with these kind of things it's being this experimental, it's hard to tell whether I have a bubble or I have a cut. But you can see there. Todd, thanks for this uh, idea of Teradex when we are starting off. While Cindy was doing her piece, I rigged up my iPhone on a beam, on a boom. Okay. So let's talk about this as I'm just blabbing. So this is uh, McGuire's plastics. It's used for cleaning up the uh, the headlamp covers on cars, um, but it works really well for plastics and uh, like acrylics and such. Um, there's a lot of products out there that are waxes with uh, with grit in them, or they're you know multi-step wax grit process uh, you know there's a lot of different products out there i like having just one even though just one isn't going to give me as nice of a finish as if i had multiple grits because you figure that you know this is just a grit suspended in some kind of uh, <laughs> suntan lotion And what you want to see is I'm looking at the reflection to see how clear that reflection is. Because if it looks like a mirror, you're done. Uh, if it isn't looking like a mirror, then we may have skimped on one of the steps or not stayed long enough in the polish. As you can see, that's getting a little bit better now. looks pretty good as far as with what the material I had that I was working with. All right, now what we want to do is pull this back out. We're not really concerned about it being concentric anymore because all I really need is just about that much to fit into the recess on the top. So I have a thin parting tool. This is actually a Dan Bailey homemade special. I picked it up at uh, the uh, Fort Collins Symposium when I was up there. But you wanna make sure that you don't get into this area 
and ruin Steve, the we lost tenor your video. that you're going to have. What's that? We lost your video. Oh, ah. There we go. It's back. Guess why? Battery? Fade to black. Oh, yeah. I hate I, that button. I leaned on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we have our finial knob, whatever you want to call it. It's not particularly gorgeous. Um, this one probably would never see the light of day, but it is kind of a cool experiment, especially looking at that portion right there. I like that cross section. It's yeah, definitely, I like that. yeah, it's definitely, I like this style better, but Ooh, nice. for a lot of products, that's a little bit too busy. Uh, this was an experiment out of, uh, this is a 3D printed and then a Luminolite's poured in there. It was actually a, test for a custom color I was doing for a guy for some knife scales. He wanted blood red and that was about as close as I could get. But uh, all right. All right. Any questions? There was a few up in the chat. Um, see if I can go back a little bit. As I drop the chuck. But they're pretty darn durable. Um, I missed the mounting of the chuck. Oh, in the chuck. What is the turquoise? Oh, it's, that is uh, this is a uh, cast resin. It's a luminite, a lumalite. What I do is when I turn these pieces, I save all of these shavings and then force it back into a mold and then pour a lightly tinted resin over the top. And that's how you get these spaghetti lines in it. Oh, or, okay, I see. The other thing is the turquoise piece. Yes, a 3D printed spacer, sorry. Could you show your Meguiar's product again? Yes. So it is Plastex. I bought it at Walmart. I don't shop at Walmart, but I knew Walmart had it, so I had to go to Walmart. Um, but there are a lot of products out there. Um, there's a lot of them that have waxes, uh, multi-step products that have waxes in them. Um, there is a product I'm experimenting with from uh, called Magic Juice, I think it's called, from Stadium Pen Blanks that I liked enough to where I asked him if I could wholesale it. Uh, we'll see if that happens, but uh, it's a great product. And it is five st uh, six steps. And that's really typical for a lot of the higher end polishes, because what happens is, is that each polish has some kind of grid in it and the grid is going to be associated in a micron size. And then microns, you could actually equate over to a sandpaper, like a one micron is about a 12,000 grit sandpaper. And you need to get into, to get a real fine polish look, you need like glass reflectivity. You would need something, uh, probably a step beyond Meguiar's. Most people aren't going to notice. Um, so if you're doing pens or you're doing CA finish on pens, uh, Abernet and Meguiar's works fine. The other option is to use uh, the product I was talking about last night, the uh, Eagle abrasives. And uh, whereas this is, I think 10 different grits up to uh, 3000 and then go on to Meguiar's. In this case, this is good for dry sanding. Abranet or Abralon isn't great for dry sanding. It does work good. And I know Cindy uses it a lot for dry sanding. Uh, it was actually made for uh, the Corian countertops, the solid countertop industry. Um, and then widely used by bowling ball polishers, um, people of that occupation, if that's an occupation. Why do I use a collet chuck? Yes, I could have used a uh, small pen jaws. Uh, the thing about a pen jaw is it's going to have openings in the, it's going to have openings in the chuck. And I don't like that if I'm working really close, 
I want to, this is just a lot safer for that. I mean, I do have these which are used for a uh, spanner wrench, but I'm working here and with a pen jaw, especially the, the ones that are used for drilling where it's just two jaws, those scare the daylights out of me. I don't know why they ever invented that. It, I think it's one of the uh, most unsafe products you can use. Yeah, it's not a knuckle buster like some other chucks. No, it's a finger eater. Yeah. They just don't go back. Ask me how I know. You tried to buy from your web, my website today and it didn't work. Oh, so the buy here button doesn't work. I found that out. You're not the first person to complain about that. Uh, just go to turningwood.com slash store and it takes you to the same place where the button was going to go or just go to turningwood.com and then the upper right hand corner banner is store is the first uh, thing to click on. Um, and I have extended my sale. Um, I think you guys were talking last night, you guys meaning um, Joe and Todd and Cindy that you your sale is going on through Labor Day. So I have extended my sale to Labor Day. So if nothing else, we can get all of these uh, things that I didn't do properly fixed and uh, everybody can get what they need. What else? Anything else? I'm I'm peering in my monitors right there. Otherwise, I can't read yeah. the monitor across the room. You probably should move on because we're getting close to yeah. the end of our uh, time. Yeah, we'll move on to uh, move on to Joe. Oh, hand me the button there. Um, oh Steve. wait, here you go. Let's see, where are you, Joe? There it is. Oh damn, it changed color. Look at that. <laughs> it's uh, the chroma keys off or something. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, so um, Joe Fleming again from Airbrushing Wood. What I'm going to do is I've got all the pieces now. They've all been mailed to me. Let me change my uh, camera here so you can see what I'm looking at. So this is the top view of the box. Here's a red uh, red knob. Here's the black knob. Um, and you can kind of see a side profile of the piece put together there. And don't have that glued in yet on purpose. I'm going to set the knobs off to the side and I've done some prep work here. So everybody's talking about sanding and everybody's talking about Aberlon and getting to where you're, you know, getting baby butt smooth. And I'm cool with that. But a um, couple things. Whenever you're applying a finish, especially when you're applying a water-based finish, the, um, the, um, oops, wrong button. There we go. The problem with the water-based finish is it's going to raise the grain. Maple is especially susceptible to that. And so um, even though they all did really awesome sanding on these two pieces, um, I'm not going to paint this piece. I'm going to paint this piece. So I've taped around the rim, that inside rim that Todd turned, and I've taped on the flat edge here of the rim, and I've just covered up the back with tape and paper, uh, number one. But I wetted this with a, just a paper towel and water and raised the grain, and it was a little fuzzy. Uh, that always happens. And then I sanded it with um, the highest grit paper I own in my shop, which is not micro. I do have some micro mesh. I didn't go dig that out. It was 1,000 grit wet dry paper. Um, and I repolished that up. Now, uh, Cindy made the comment about high sanding grits versus low sanding grits. When I do my, my uh, coloring, what I do is I generally only go to about 220. And it's a difference of philosophy and maybe it's a difference of why you do it. So I'm just gonna cover this very briefly so I can get on with the project. This is figured maple. Um, it's, I just resawed it um, and in two halves. This is a whole color palette of dye I used to carry. Actually, it cut this way. Um, I don't carry this product anymore, but um, this has black dye sanded back to expose uh, clear grain. And then I airbrushed in all the colors in a sequence to show them all off. Um, this is the kind of effect that you can get. And this has been polished. Steve was talking about polishing. Uh, at one time, although these have been handled a lot, I used to take them to shows, 
they're pretty beat up. But he was talking about a mirror finish. Here's what I mean when I when I teach this with a mirror finish. You can read Grex, uh, except for my writing is bad. It says Grex titanium white on there, and you should be able to hold that up to the surface and read it like a mirror. Now you can see right there in the reflection in the red, although there's some grain in the way there. Let's see if I can move it around a little bit. Get out of that gra that dark grain right there. You can see that you can read that almost. Uh, the, the, the grain of the wood, the black in there is kind of obscuring it, but I can see the words uh, Grex as I find a, uh, sometimes some of these spots have been kind of roughed up, but you get the idea. When I teach this, I make everybody take something with writing on it and not just put it up there and say, oh, I can read it. Like right there is a good spot to read it. Um, you guys can see it right there. But um, I make them go over the entire, oh, there, really good right there. Um, I make them go over the entire surface. And if there's any spots on there, actually this piece is all pretty good. I got the right angle. Um, if there's any spots where it gets hazy, they got to go back and fix the haze. That's how a quality finish is made. And when you polish. Now, Steve was using uh, a series of uh, sandpapers and then the plastic to finish uh, from McGuire's to finish. I happen to use uh, 400, 600, 800, 1,000 grit paper wet with water to sand it. And then once it's dead flat smooth, you can still see this, the haze from the sanding. What you don't want to have is any of the pits of the wood uh, translate through the finish. You want the finish to be glass smooth. It may be hazy, but it's glass smooth. You don't see any pores of the wood when you hold it up and reflect it. Once it's dead smooth, that's the way float glass would be very, very smooth with no little ripples in it or anything. Then I get out Meguiar's auto body polishes. And I happen to use Meguiar's medium cut, Meguiar's fine cut, Meguiar's swirl remover. And then I use um, um, their show, show polish, I think it's called. If you go in, the, in my education tab on uh, my website in the bottom left-hand corner, there, the very last article I think there said something about the Don Dairy finishing technique. It's all explained how to get that kind of a finish on your piece. Um, I don't use dyes so much anymore because I found that dyes um, will fade. And even quote the metal acid dyes that are supposed to be very superior in light retention, uh, colors will fail. And I'm not gonna get into the details of how I figured that out. I did some testing and uh, I've, I've, I've kind of moved away from dyes personally. Uh, the main reason why I don't carry dye anymore. I don't want to sell products that I don't use uh, that much. So I uh, sanded it. We talked about sanding. I wet, wetted it and then re-sanded it. Now, everybody talked about the speed of the lathe. So uh, airbrushing, speed of the airbrush is um, 25 PSI. We'll call it that. So there's some red. And I have my compressor set at 25 PSI. That's generally where I spray. Your mileage may vary of how you're gonna do this. I'm gonna leave this here for just a second to talk about technique. The other thing is they talked about uh, all their tool grinds. I use 4040 also. So I have my airbrush in my hand. It's at about a 45 degree angle down to the paper. And you can see my angle here, the included angle from here back down to the horizon is about 40 degrees. There's the 4040. So there you go, we all use it. Um, actually, uh, I'm not really paying attention to angles there. I was making a joke about that, but um, I do hold my airbrush this way. I'm left-handed. And so uh, the paint comes here, goes down to the surface. And so I go bottom left to upper right on my spray area. Now, one more thing I'm gonna talk about here is in terms of working. Uh, this is different than a turning work area. This is a um, this is a painting studio now, if you will. So I'm going to zoom back. Oops, a little too far there. Let me come up a little closer. Move my camera a tiny bit. This is my other than the monitor um, and the camera you see over here on the on my right. Um, this is pretty much how I set up for painting all the time. So what do I have? I got. I always have the table covered with brown craft paper that protects everything. You can see how much overspray happens over here because of my left-handedness. 
Um, I always paint on a clean white surface. This will move away when we get going on our project. I don't want to transfer any paint up to the bottom of my piece. Now this one's been all taped off, but it's easy to get uh, paint to come up on the bottom if you're not careful. Um, I have airbrushes here to my left. They're in a cradle. This is an airbrush holder. When you buy a kit, you get one of those. Um, I have my compressor sit down here on the floor. Um, there it is. You can barely see it right there. It's green. It's a small compressor sitting there. It's handy for me. Uh, it's close so the hose isn't too long. Uh, it's easy grip over here. I have one hose and I, I use a quick connect on all the bottoms of all the airbrushes so I can easily uh, snap them on and off with just an air chuck. The chuck that I use is this one here. It's, this also comes in the kit and allows you if you use multiple brushes to take them on and off quickly. Um, so anyway, um, I have my paints and all my liquids over here. So I have all these are bottles of paint mostly. Um, I've got a couple of reducers here. Um, I have uh, a cleaning cup here. That's just a, a cheap cup. Any paper cup would do with some paper towels shoved in it. That's a, a cup full of denatured alcohol we'll use for cleaning, although we're not going to go through cleaning tonight. Um, I've got all my miscellaneous tools here that are long and skinny. Uh, the only thing I don't have out there is pipe cleaners, which are in this container here. Uh, I've got a, an X-Acto knife for cutting masking when I use it. I got a pencil. I got a cheap paintbrush for cleaning. I've got some uh, Sharpies I use. Um, I've got a, a hone, a diamond hone here that I use for sharpening my blade of my knife. I was doing that while uh, uh, Steve was working. I've got a dental pick here. I've got a burnishing tool here I use when I use frisket. I got some tweezers. And then I have uh, my wrench for my uh, airbrush. I've got some toothpicks here I use for cleaning uh, both the the little style that you can you clean with the little feathers on them from gum plus round toothpicks. My wife bought me cocktail toothpicks, so that's why I got colored ones. Um, and then uh, I, I, because when I do demos, I don't try to mess with, if you have one airbrush, you're gonna have to clean in between. We're not gonna get into that tonight. I do, I have an arsenal. So here's part of the arsenal. I've got three already loaded up with paint here to my left. I've got three more there in case I need them. And I've got a couple more in a box if I gotta dig them out will be uh, creative and move fast. Um, alcohol will come later. That's just uh, some uh, flavored water right now. Now over here is my paint box. So let me move this stuff out of the way for a second. And you can see I've got a huge box full of paint. That's all Grex, mostly Grex paint. That's the paint I use most of the time. I, and I sell that of course, but um, it happens to be the paint that I like the most, which is why I started selling. Now you'll notice I got a roll of paper towels here. That's so that uh, for, you know, I'm in San Diego, we have SeaWorld, and they always make a joke about the splash zone. If you sit in the first seven rows, you're going to get wet. This is the splash zone over here for overspray. So I put the paper towels there, and I learned after a while that when I was painting, and I ended up with spray bottles covered full of paint, getting, because left-handed, put the paint in the cup, set the bottle down, start spraying, and then they all got paint on them. So now I'm good about keeping them over there. So anything I don't want paint on, is over here. Anything I don't care about or I can clean easy is over here. And so I use the roll of paper towels to protect. I have a pile of paper towels right here. Uh, let me get my mug out of there. And those are, I just have them pre-torn, ready to go. Um, I use the anything with a half sheet roll, typically what I do. And uh, mouse pad, of course, isn't normally here. And uh, I think we're ready to roll. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, normally when I paint, I do drills. I was doing drills off camera while you guys were listening to everybody else, but I try to warm up so I know how the paint's going to perform, how the brush is going to perform, etc. I'm not going to go into that today, but that's already step one. Step two is I don't commit to a good project with a design or an, a, a technique until I know how it's going to perform. Now, one thing about woodworking is I'm going to zoom this in now. Let me zoom that in. and readjust the camera. And zoom in a tiny bit more. Oops, wrong button. Um, so what I do is um, I practice on paper or I practice on uh, a piece of scrap wood. I buy um, Baltic birch plywood by the boatload. 
and um, I use it for practice panels and for doing designs. And even when teaching, here's a project I did on a piece of plywood uh, with a club. And, uh, you know, that's going to end up going to the club um, after I get done signing it and putting a finish on it. And, um, you know, it's a really nice piece in that regard. So this is just eighth inch Baltic birch plywood. Um, etc. is what I use. Uh, it works great. So we just got a scrap here that I've been doing other things on. I'm not worried about that, um, but I am going to demonstrate the technique. So here's the technique I'm going to try today. This is the first time I've used this. Uh, I've done a little practicing offline. I am going to color the wood. Now, coloring, when I want to get a big area colored, I don't go close because if you go close, you're going to end up with showing your lines. So now I put uh, some reducer in there. So it's flowing pretty good, but you're already starting to see it uh, bubble up because there's too much paint there. And if you try to go, actually, there's some frisket there I just noticed. That was from left over from this project. I didn't even notice it. So there's the frisket that was left over from that previous thing. I didn't see that. So that's why it was getting bubbly. Um, but normally when you get too close, you can see the lines in your paint. When you want to color an area, you come back far away, I'm eight inches off the surface and I can just keep the airbrush moving and I can put down a nice dense color and let it dry a little bit. Now we're gonna cheat on drying because we don't have much time and I can use a hair dryer. Do I recommend using a hair dryer? The answer is no. I don't recommend using a hair dryer. Why? Because uh, the paint's going to dry by, I'm going to put a microphone up closer to my mouth in case I'm making too much noise with the tools. Um, it will skim over the paint, but it's wet underneath and then it could dry with a wrinkle in it. And you don't want that. So I don't generally use a hairdryer, but for this project, we're going to, we might accelerate it because I can see it's still a little bit wet in here. You can't really tell, well, right there, you can kind of see the, the dark red is where it's still wet. Um, I'm not going to touch it, but putting down color now. We're going to do a couple of different techniques. So I'm going to swap hoses, swap the hose to a different brush. And um, one of the techniques we're going to do is a splattering technique. So I have a popsicle stick and I'm going to put my airbrush. I'm going to turn this sideways so you can see it right close. Let me get over here. There you go. Right close to the tip. And if I look at where the needle is pointing, the needle is pointing about an eighth of an inch from behind the tip of that. You can't really see that, but I'm going to spray the paint off the edge and let it go down onto the surface and we'll see what happens. So what was happening there is a couple things. One is um, I was getting splatters that was on purpose, but there's also, it's actually looking a little bit planetoid there. You can't quite see all the speckles. It looks a little washed out because the camera is not great. I'm gonna fix that. I just bought a new camera, but I have to get it uh, cabled up here. Um, but um, um, that's one way for me to get an effect is by using a splatter. It's probably, and the farther back I move on the end of the popsicle stick, the bigger the splatters are. And so I want to get a splattery effect. Think of like uh, stars in the sky. I'm gonna to switch to another airbrush. I'm gonna do the same thing with a different color. This time, black, I'm just going to turn this uh, uh, stick over and do the same thing. And now you can see down here, you see it a little stronger, but the little black specks are all over the place. That is a kind of a cool effect. So uh, we're going to probably be doing some of that here. So a couple more experiments we're going to try before we commit to our project. And that is, um, you know, you can buy templates. I don't think I talked about those too much. I buy a lot of templates because I do a lot of airbrushing. Uh, I love this circle template, for example. I'm not going to spend any time with that today, but it's like 20 or $25. You can spend a lot of money on quality airbrush templates. You don't have to do that. This is cheesecloth. I don't remember. I probably bought that on Amazon and I can spray right through that. Uh, this happens to be black paint. and lift it off. And right down here, you can kind of see a little bit of a hatchy grid, uh, kind of a dusting effect. Um, if I put more paint down, it would probably do better. This is an open 
weave cheesecloth. You can get tighter grain, probably won't go through. Uh, here's a piece of burlap. Haven't tried this one before. Let's see what happens. I'll come over here. There's burlap. So I get some kind of a texture um, and you can play with it. This um, is a template that I made for a project I did. I'm gonna put it down here on the white so you can see it. I needed some stars. So I took my X-Acto knife and just cut out the stars. There's a shooting star and here's some squiggles. All I have to do is, this is just a piece of the same paper that I'm working on. This is watercolor paper. And I can go down, spray, I'm eight, six or eight inches. I'm holding it down tight to the surface. There's some stars. I smeared them because I just moved. There's some small stars. There's a crescent moon. Here's a, a ray and here's that shooting star all on the paper. I only lifted up. I might have smeared the stars. And there's all those figures right there. Homemade, easy to do. You can also buy um, the, at this material with nothing in it and cut your own. Um, I have some of that as well. If I have something I really like, I commit it to this. This though is cheap and easy and fast. The only problem is after you use it a while, the wetness around the edges will soak into the paper and cause it to start getting mushy. Um, so you have to let that dry. You can see where I've covered it with some tape in the back, um, masking tape, there you go, to uh, help protect the paper when it started getting cruddy. This is a template that I bought um, for a couple different reasons, but it has a cool texture on it. Um, I use it for bark. I use it for water. Um, and we're gonna maybe use it on the rim tonight. Let's see what that looks like. I'm just putting a spot down and just gonna, I'm back far from the paper or from the surface of the template. Um, I'm gonna lift it up by hinging it up. I don't wanna smear. And there I get a, a different texture. You can buy those if you want. But again, that one probably costs 20 to $25. I don't remember. So those are kind of things you can do for effects without a lot of effort. For those of you that might be familiar with Stuart Fiorini, he's over in England. Um, he does a lot of crazy stuff with airbrushes. He's very creative and just experiments all the time on the platters that he turned, mostly platters. And uh, it's pretty cool to watch. Um, anyway, oh, I wanna make one comment to one of the participants here, if he's still here, Sean Graham, be nice to Bambi. Um, so enough on that. So I'm going to put this away. We're going to start working on the project. Uh, for those of you um, um, that don't know, Sean Graham has a YouTube channel. And um, um, I'm also a follower of his on Instagram. And he built a, a, a garden with raised beds with a high fence around it. And he's had a whole herd of deer uh, figuring ways to sneak in there to eat his plants. And it's been uh, enjoyable to watch him battle uh, Bambi and family. So here's the plate. What I was thinking I'm going to do is I'm going to make the whole rim red. Now, the red that I'm using is um, private stock uh, naphthol red. It happens to be uh, 105 is the color number. That doesn't mean anything other than when you want to buy it. But um, the, they have two reds in their arsenal. One's naphthol red, one's pyro red. Naphthol red, um, if you look at a color wheel, true red. If you go a little bit toward the blue side, that's naphthol red. If you go a tiny bit toward the yellow side, that's pyro red. So this has just the hint of blue. There's not any really strong yellow in that. So you can see uh, that it has almost a purplish cast. I wanted that on purpose. Because what's going to happen is we're spraying on top of maple. Maple has yellow in it. That's probably going to bring out some yellow. So I wanted it to tip it toward the blue. So as we come back, it'll be uh, closer to true red. So I'm going to spray from here down to the rim. I'm going to spray across the rim. I have the tape uh, put up there. Uh, one more thing about the design here. Uh, Steve and I, or not Steve, uh, Todd and I talked prior to the demo before he turned this as we were designing it as a team, I said, uh, Todd, I need this rim to be square so I can put tape on it. And I need this rim here to be square, this rim here, so I can put tape on it, as opposed to rounding it over, because that's what he was initially thinking of doing. So when I design pieces that I'm gonna paint, I think about masking as well. So you always wanna think about where edges are gonna be. If I had to resand this, I could put this back on the lathe with say a vacuum check, and I don't remember if the recess was on there, I'll have to look. If Todd left that recess on there, I could put it back on a chuck 
and I could re-sand this rim if the paint bleeds over. But I've gone all the way around and pushed the tape down around the edge so it, hopefully the paint won't leak under. I've taken a popsicle stick and pushed that one around inside that crevice to hold it in tight. Here we go. I don't want to spray into the paint, into the tape this way because it could blow up underneath. And I don't want to spray this way and hit the edge of the tape here because it could blow down inside. So what I'm going to do is kind of hit it at an angle like this. But I'm going to be up high, see how much color I'm putting down. Not very much. And I'm putting red on there right now, slightly angled into the rim. And I'm just turning the plate and I'm keeping the airbrush moving. I don't want to linger. I'm touching the tape on the rim and tape in the middle just to keep it going. So I'm going to stop. Now, look at that. That's paint. It's called transparent paint. You can definitely see the grain of the wood there. And when you put a clear finish on it, that will be uh, even uh, stronger. So we haven't ruined the effect there. Now, you notice that there's a white, I'm going to call it a white band right next to the rim here. That's where the, the edge of the wood is coming up. And what's happening is you're getting a snow fence effect. When you airbrush, any little edge will create a, a, an eddy of air that will either cause paint to deposit and get heavy or cause paint to not go there and leave an area. So now we have that little gap. That actually might not be a bad feature. So what I'm thinking is I like that. So I'm just gonna stay out toward the rim now and I'm gonna be spraying here and I'm gonna push the, the dish into the paint stream and I'm only gonna paint near the rim now. And I'm up far enough that I don't have to worry about moving the brush, I don't wanna linger. And I just went all the way around and I just hit the rim. And now you can see it got a lot darker all the way around. I'm gonna stop right there, I like that effect. So there we go and we have it now with paint, Paint, you are obscuring the grain a little bit, but we still have a, I see a lot more figure in there than maybe you can see in the, in the camera. Cause like I said, I got not a great camera, but uh, it's looking pretty good. And um, I like that effect. So we're gonna try um, the, the speckle effect. So um, I'm gonna start with, what color do I have here? I don't even remember. I'm gonna put the black, yeah, this is the black. I wanted that one. I'm gonna put the black down first. So um, I get the tip on the stick and I gotta be careful about the, uh, my airbrush sliding up and down because if I do that, it's gonna change the size of the speckles. Closer to the end, smaller speckles, back farther, bigger speckles. I want bigger speckles. So I'm back and the needle is pointing right now about a quarter inch back. And I'm gonna come over here and test it. Okay, you can see a little bit of the speckles. They're a pretty good size actually, and I'm not gonna move it back farther. So I'm gonna come in. And I've got quite a few speckles there. I got little ones and big ones. I'm gonna stop. I don't wanna overdo it. That's something you can be do. Now, those drops of paint are wet and they're gonna be wet for a little bit. So I gotta be careful, I can't touch that surface with my hands or we got a smear. But like I said, I've got the best paint eraser, which is called, put it on the lathe and, and re-sand it. Um, it won't absorb into this maple very far, so I don't have to worry about it. Now I'm switching to the white. There's the white, you can see I made a little dip. I'm gonna switch to a clean popsicle stick so I don't get any of that on there. And I'm going to, Get ready and start making speckles over here first, quarter inch away. There's the white speckles. Now I'm gonna rotate this by touching the tape on the edges and just come around to a different angle. I'm gonna wipe paint off of there because I already put some on it. What happens, you gotta be careful. Paint will puddle up on, on the end of the popsicle stick. And if you go over your surface, it could drip off and then you got a big block. So I'm gonna start on the far edge and work my way back so I don't get any of that drip happening. So there's the white. I want more of the white than I wanted the black. And there we go. So now we've got the rim decorated with white and black speckles on there. Um, it looks like it's a little bit void right in. We've got to be careful. I don't want to drip. Uh, white and black speckles right here. And I'm going to put a little bit. Nah, I don't want to. Yeah, maybe. I'm going to try to hit it, get it going again. 
All right, that looks good. Now, those bubbles of paint are going to take a while to dry. I want them to dry round. And I can't, let, if I wanted to do this on the surface, that would be interesting. But if I touch that surface, all that paint's going to uh, smear. So I'm going to leave it alone for a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk. Hopefully, you can hear me. I'm going to put the hairdryer on. And I'm just going to keep it not too close. But I'm just going to work on drying that paint. Um, any questions that you have about, uh, do I ever blend uh, colors in the pot? Um, yes. Actually, I'm done with the colors. I want to set this aside for a second over here off to the side. Uh, let's talk about color blending. Um, since you asked that question, while we're letting that dry a little bit, we can play. So here is the red. Now, I've used up most of the red in there, but there's still red down in the bottom. I'm going to put some yellow right on top. Don't worry about the splatters. Now, I put yellow right in there. I'm not going to stir it or anything else. There's two things you can do about blending in the pot. Number one, you could take a, a paint stick or something, go down there and stir it a little bit. But down here in the end of the to uh, toothbrush, end of the airbrush is red paint, and you're not going to stir that. What you can do is a technique that's called back flushing. Now, I use this technique for cleaning, but I also use it for stirring. If I put my finger over the end of the airbrush like this, it, the air cannot escape. So the air instead goes backwards up into the cup and it causes the red paint that was down in here to blow up in here and the bubbles cause the paint to stir. You can do that. I'm not gonna do that this time. I'm gonna use the blending in the cup and watch what happens. So there's red. And there comes the yellow and look, I got orange in between. And then I just used up all the paint. Now the problem is when you go dark to light, um, so you'll always have a little bit of the dark color in there. So it's always going to be a little bit tinted. You'll never get it pure one color. If I were to go yellow to red, by the time I got to the red, you're just not going to see the yellow and you'll get real red. Um, I do a, a technique um, where you blend on the go. And this is part of the class when I teach it. So anybody interested, you're going to learn this technique, what we just did here um, on a, a project like this. In this case, I put yellow in the airbrush, paint the sky down low. I put some, um, in this case, I used red um, ochre, I think it was the next, no, I used some regular red, um, probably pyro red, and put a little bit in and spray some in over here and let the yellow just fade to orange and red. And then I put uh, the uh, red ochre, which is a brownish red, and fade that right in to do the next layer of color. And then up here is uh, burnt umber, um, a darker brown and just let the colors blend in the airbrush as you go. You don't have to do any cleaning in between. Yes, this is acrylic paint, it's ex and it is, uh, uh, Daniel, it is for airbrushing. Um, airbrush, I mentioned this last night, airbrush paint has very fine grind to it um, for uh, painting with, um, um, in an airbrush. The nozzle is very, very small on an airbrush. And when you're painting through that nozzle, uh, if it's a regular fluid paint, the, the, the chunks of color in the paint are too thick and you're gonna get plugging of your airbrush. So you wanna use airbrush paint. Uh, and it is acrylic, it's water-based. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions that popped up while we're going. Uh, blending colors, uh, let's see. So I guess that kind of uh, covers it. Now, we're gonna do a vote here. So I got now I got a dirty piece of paper. This is why I do it on paper. I can take this paper and put it aside, let it dry on the one side and the other side will become a clean palette for another day, but not today. This is pretty clean. So um, I can put that down there um, and we can say, do I wanna do anything more with it? Um, I don't want to overwork it. I'm kind of happy with the way that looks. So um, I'm going to say, I'm going to call it done. Now what's going to happen off camera is I'm going to use a clear acrylic spray lacquer 
to cut to paint this or finish this and to cover all this. I'm going to carefully pull this tape off. And so you can see what it looks like without all the tape. I got to be careful about hitting the paint on the surface. So I'm pulling it toward the center. It's just a piece of paper I put in there to fill in the gap. And I don't want to put the lid on because there's paint right up to where the lid goes. So I'm checking my fingers. I'm going to very carefully touch it here and I'm going to peel off the back, which is mostly a big piece of paper. Set that aside. And now there's the tape and there's that happens to be the end of the tape. And I'm going to hold the rim carefully and pull at a pretty steep angle. I don't want it um, to tear or come up into the paint. Now I use painter's tape. I don't use frog tape. Frog tape sticks too firmly. And um, I find that it's sometimes um, it's hard to remove without causing problems. So um, I like tape that's kind of low tack. So I'm looking around the rim to see if we had any leakage and I'm seeing none. So the masking worked pretty good. I'm looking at the rim on the inside edge and the masking worked pretty good. So there it is. Again, I'm going to hold, I'm going to suspend this because I don't want to get it. I got to be careful about dropping it, but there's the finished piece with the lid. Um, now, haven't decided which knob. So I'm going to actually put the black knob in because it's a little bit tighter fit and I'm going to hold it up at an angle. Nice. Oh, I, like I kind of like that one. I was thinking I wanted yeah. to use the pink knob, uh, but I kind of like that. So. I think we're going to call that done. This is the piece that we're going to auction tomorrow night, one of two. So what you saw in the demonstration was everybody in the group took a piece of this project and started. So Todd did, like he said, five plates or some big number. He picked the best two and moved them forward. Then for tonight's demonstration, he did another one, which isn't part of actually going to end up in a project. And Cindy did the same thing and Steve did the same thing. And all the pieces ended up here. I've got one full set, which you see in front of you now, and I'll end up with another full set when I get the, the second lid and the second top. And what I'll do on that for painting, it's got all figured maple, it's the same wood that you saw tonight. Um, I will go, I'm gonna do a different effect on the rim, but it'll be something maybe like what we talked about. I really personally love that texture. And so I'm gonna play with this. And I kind of like the way the burlap turned out on that piece of wood. And so I'm gonna pull, I'm not gonna do it on the real project until I get comfortable with it, but I kind of like that effect too. I'm gonna play some more with the texture and that's what's gonna end up on the rim of the second piece. And then the knob will either be the pink knob here or Steve sent me three knobs to use, depending on how the colors go, um, kind of a, um, um, a white knob. So this one looks like it was also, um, um, I don't know if that was cat or, crumbs of paint or this was just the coloring mica. that you put it mica that's the mica so yeah. it has kind of a shimmery look to it i like that this one here is is that a ground up one yeah so that's with shavings uh and the black one is one where he did this where he showed that red one with the uh kind of the it, it, it's the laser printed one right this one 3d printed yeah 3d printed yeah and so i do have another one too Okay, let's see. Let me answer some questions. You um, made one today. Well, I have another one in, in addition to that too. Yeah. So, um, Craig, you've got an oil type compressor. Um, nice. Basically, you want to have a regulator that's going to, yes, you need a filter. You want to trap oil and water. And I recommend that um, when you do your uh, air trap, if you're going to use your big compressor, I'm going to switch cameras back to myself here. I look great, um, Steve. Oh, when you uh, when you look at that, I, I just smeared my eye with paint. <laughs> you punched yourself. You got a black I eye punched though. myself. Oh, that looks great, Joe. It's makeup. <laughs> um, what I do is um, you don't see it here, but on my airbrush holder, if you have there, so that you'll see kits on the airbrush on my webpage for sale that say uh, I have a compressor, and if you have a compressor, 
what I do is I substitute the compressor with a regulator filter and you put the regulator filter right on your airbrush holder next to you. And then you regulate your air here, not over wherever your big compressor is. The problem with the big compressor when you put a filter right on it is that the air coming out of those things is hot. Hot air holds moisture and the moist air can get past the, the water trap, get into your hose and into your airbrush. And if moist air is getting through, that means the oil in there is getting through too. So mm -hmm. um, I use an oil compressor and I have a trap next to my filter and it's all greasy. If you look at it, it's gross because it's catching all that oil. And I have one here if I'm using the big compressor. And so I leave that set, I'm pointing that direction because it's in my shop uh, 20 feet away from me that direction. Um, and I run the air hose over here and then I hook it up to this regulator. This one's catching water, it doesn't catch much oil. And, and then I turn it down. So that one's set at 90 or 100, this one's set at 25. What else? Uh, sealer used on the bare wood. David, yes, well on this one, no. Most of the time I seal the wood before I paint. Now, maple is very tight grain, and I know I don't need to seal it like I would uh, other woods. Anything that has any kind of por porosity, porosity, whatever the word is, is porous. Um, I worry about that because you can start getting blotchiness. If you're painting on cherry, you're painting on walnut, you're painting on uh, oak or ash or uh, birch, all those have more open grains and will have the potential for blotchiness. I seal them all. I usually use either spray lacquer or I use sanding sealer of some sort. I've done it with shellac. I tend to want to spray it on so I don't spray shellac as much, but you can buy uh, spray shellac. Just make sure it is de-waxed. You do not want wax in your uh, finish that you're putting down before you put something else on top. And um, I also use a uh, sanding sealer that I buy in a can and put it in a spray gun or put it in my airbrush and spray it on. Most of the time, I, um, you can't see it, but right back over here on my right, I have uh, about 20 cans of deft uh, clear lacquer. I buy um, um, satin usually. Uh, I have gloss and satin. I have to buy it out of state because in California, I can't buy it. So I buy it usually buy a 12 cans in a case. When I visit family in Arizona, um, and then I can bring it home. <laughs> Same with the natured alcohol. I have to buy that uh, out of state and drive it home too. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm working personally on learning how to use uh, water-based lacquers and water-based finishes more. I've, I've done a lot of them. I'm not 100% convinced I'm good enough yet to know how to do it. There's a guy up in Seattle named Jay Simpson. Um, who does a lot of water-based lacquers. His work is fabulous. I know it's doable because he does it and it looks great. He's written an article, I think in, in the AEW journal about two years ago on his process. I remember reading it somewhere and I've seen him demonstrate it a couple of times and I've called him numbers of times for uh, advice. And so when I have time to play, I use that, but I won't use it here because it's, it's, I don't want to commit to uh, something I don't know how it's going to perform. I do have some clear spray lacquer that happens to come from Chromacraft. And I'm gonna use that on this piece, top and bottom and on the lid, top and bottom. Anything else? Uh, okay, that was all the questions I see there. Um, oh, and when I do the lacquer, it's, it's also for, when I do the sealer, it's also for grain filler. If I'm using an open wood, like a oak or ash, I'll often spread some kind of a, a paint. Here is a tube of, um, Hmm. Thick bodied acrylic paint. This happens to be from Liquid Tex, um, but you can buy it from any quality paint. Smear it in with some gloves on your hands, let it dry, sand it off, and you end up with the pores of the wood filled with paint. But you see oh. the wood through it, and it also acts as a filler, but it highlights the pores. So it makes it have that effect. It works really good on ash. I don't have any samples here to show you, I don't think, but um, otherwise I would. 